Well, thank you for being here today. You know, I got up this morning, I looked out the window, I saw the rain, it was dark, the government is shut down, and I looked at my schedule and I said, I wonder if today is uh, one of those work at home days. <laughs> and then I remembered that we had this discussion today on women's economic empowerment and reproductive health. And I just felt energized. I, I, you know, this is such a good topic. It's really critical, relevant, and practical. So I'm really glad that we're able to, to have the discussion today. And this is exactly what we do at the Wilson Center. Our boss, the president and CEO, Jane Harmon, of the Wilson Center, describes us as an intellectual candy shop where you <coughs> don't get fat on spin. And I think of us very much in that way. She talks about us as being a trusted platform for dialogue, where we frame issues for policymakers, and where we provide actionable ideas. And that's very much our mission, and very much what we do in the service of, uh, um, in the spirit of Woodrow Wilson's memory and serving as a living memorial to President Wilson. So thank you for coming in today, for braving the elements, and uh, um, bearing with the fact that the government is shut down, because sometimes that's what we need. We need to brave the elements and bypass governments uh, to move forward and make progress on, on this particular topic. So I'm Roger Mark D'Souza. I'm the Director of Population, Environmental Change, and Security here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And today's discussion is part of our health program, which stands for health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. We look at all of the, these issues and how they're related. And it's part of a five-year effort that is generously supported by USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. And as you think about these issues, the questions around gender, women's empowerment, and economic empowerment is really a central part of what we look at and think about how it is linked to other sectors, particularly development overall, the environment, livelihoods, and security. When we look at the Millennium Development Goals and the fact that um, one of the goals is oriented towards the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women really has helped continue to have this issue be an important focus. The, the goals, the Millennium Development Goals, beyond, go beyond just having a goal on this issue to say that looking at these issues and the empowerment of women is an important component that um, contributes to the elimination of poverty, hunger, and diseases. So these are some of the issues that we want to talk about and think a little bit about how reproductive health fits in into that um, context. And this is an issue that the UN Foundation has been looking at most recently, just last month, together with ExxonMobil, the UN Foundation released a new research report called A Roadmap for Promoting Women's Economic Empowerment. And it was a project that really looked at a series of separate studies and compiled more than 100 empirical evaluations to learn about what works in four key sectors, sectors and categories around entrepreneurship, farming, wage employment, and young women's employment. So this is, is an important topic that many of us in this sector are looking at um, and examining. The discussion today does not relate to that UN Foundation study, but to another effort that's ongoing um, and is the result of work that Alaka Basu is, is working on at the UN Foundation as a senior fellow on women and population at the foundation. And this is a work in progress. So she is very much looking for feedback, reactions, thoughts, so she can continue to refine and, and develop um, the paper that she's working on with a hope that it will help to contribute to women's economic empowerment and think of the connections between reproductive health and, and rights. So Alka, as you know, is a senior fellow at the UN Foundation. She has a strong interest in public health 
has published widely on reproductive health, family planning, gender, and development, and has also served on the governing boards of the Population Association of America, the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, and the Population Council in New York. So with that, with that introduction, I'm going to hand it over to Alka to tell us a little bit about the key uh, components of her paper and to help frame the discussion and dialogue that we are looking forward to having uh, today. So Alka. Thank you. And I should get out of your way so that people can see. They can see. But can you? The, the, the uh, PowerPoint, can you see it? Okay. Uh, as Roger Mark just said, this is very much a work in progress. It's really, that's partly why you're not being given access to an actual paper or even the PowerPoint presentation. But, and, and my, I mean, I want to get something out of it by having more discussion and interaction. So what I'm going to do is just present some of my ideas and what I'm trying <coughs> to do here and hope that then Wendy, Roger, Mark will both have things to tell, uh, ask or suggest or criticize and that some of you will do the same and so we can move on from there. Uh, and the reason now, uh, as Roger Mark said, this is about women's economic empowerment and reproductive health and it's sort of not really follow up to, but it does, uh, nor does it take off from it. it, is an independent study. But the idea for it did come from the other UNF project on how does one improve women's economic empowerment in uh, through interventions and specific kinds of work for women. Uh, looking at that got me thinking about what is it that we mean when we talk about something like empowerment or women's empowerment or even sexual and reproductive high rights and health? We all use these words all the time. In fact, not only do we use the words, we've become smart enough now to use the abbreviations only, not even the words. We all know what we mean. So this long, cumbersome title can very easily be changed to this, and you'll all know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, okay. So this stands for Women's Economic Empowerment and so sexual and reproductive health and rights, and the subtitle is mine, what do we know, what can we know? Because that is part of the question that some of these things we do have good uh, empirical evidence on. Many of these things we don't, and maybe it's with existing data we cannot. So I'm going, uh, I'm, this paper sort of tries to move forward by even asking, how is it possible to even understand some of these relationships instead of, which is what we tend to do, uh, rightly so from the policy point of view where we don't want to keep thinking and thinking we want to be doing. So we keep trying to, th uh, we assume that we know what the relationship is and what, uh, so all that we need to do is now discover how to increase women's economic empowerment and what that's, and how that's going to be good for women's sexual and reproductive health. So that's the question that I'm asking. Do we really know? What should we know? Not, uh, and, and how can we go about knowing more so that we do a better job of understanding what these things are. Okay. So, so, uh, so as I've, and so in the process, actually, I am becoming a bit of a nitpicker. I'm trying to understand what words like empowerment mean. Everyone uses the word empowerment. I mean, it's now such an overused word. Uh, it's you are empowered if you have a choice of 10 different shampoos in the grocery store. You're empowered if you have 100 kinds of cereal to buy. You're empowered by virtually anyone wanting to sell you something. And so I'm trying to, to think beyond that way of looking at empowerment and asking about what is meaningful empowerment, especially in the context of this paper, which is about women's economic empowerment and really the question of women's sexual and reproductive health and rights. As Roger Mark said, these, both these issues are going to be central. They already come in some form or the other in the current MDGs. They're going to be central in the post-2015 development agenda. And the question, and the reason I'm interested in them also is because uh, typically for reasons of convenience, for reasons of direct, uh, uh, fo for reasons of focus, we are going to in the post-2015 agenda very likely have something like the MDGs where we list 
10 or 11 or 12, the high level panel I think suggests 12, 10 or 12 uh, outcomes, 12 in the targets that countries will be signing up to. And we do two things. One is we assume that each of this is an independent target. So we don't talk enough about how one target might in fact affect the other. And the second thing we do is we assume that when they do affect another, each other, it's a win-win situation. So if a target is good for one thing, if, the, if we can improve, improve a women's economic activity, if at all there is an impact on their reproductive health, that's going to be positive. So it's going to make our job easier. So the question I ask here, is it so obvious that all the targets are either independent or they're linked in such a positive way that all we can do is get better. Each target that we meet is going to help us meet the others. And my, I conclude that maybe we need to uh, also think of some of the non-win situations and how one can therefore deal with those uh, and anticipate those and therefore in fact mitigate those or else prioritize. If one target clearly has, uh, has impacts that are negative on another target, what do we do? Do we sit back and say we don't do anything or do we prioritize one target over the other and or do we in fact think of means to lessen the negative impact which is ideally what I would like. So those are the kinds of questions that uh, come up when one tries to link these. Uh, so I look at just two of the targets, women's economic empowerment, which I'm expecting gender equality in employment is going to be a major part of the post-2015 agenda. Sexual and reproductive rights and health are going to be a major part of the post-2015 agenda. So that's what I'm looking at and trying to see how much we can anticipate based on existing evidence, what we can think about in terms of what else can be done. Okay. So why does it, and the way I'm doing this, uh, why does it matter? I've already told you why it matters. This is the trouble with my PowerPoints. I'm very bad with PowerPoints. And uh, to this morning, I had to stop doing a good PowerPoint because I didn't know how to introduce arrows into the thing. So there are no charts. All I'm going to do, so, but, uh, but I, I, I'll just keep talking. And if you feel that I need to clarify, just ask, please. OK, so why is this uh, important? Why does it matter? I've already given you one reason why it's important, because of the interlinkage of these goals. But it's also it's also important really at an inter uh, intellectual level. It's important because we use these words like empowerment, rights, responsibilities, uh, and think we are all saying the same thing. And very often we might not be saying the same thing. It's bad enough when one is looking at one, the, un, in the 1980s and 90s, the measure of empowerment, that women's empowerment that everyone talked about was education. And even to understand how education is empowering is difficult enough, but we've made some progress in that. Now we are more into women's economic activity. And that's much even more complicated as you'll discover when I talk. At the same time, we need to do it for all the reasons I mentioned. We need to do it because actually we don't, uh, we need to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future when, for example, whether or not the women's economic employment is a goal in the post 2015 agenda, women's economic activity levels are rising everywhere. So given that that's going to happen, what do we think some of the implications of emp for empowerment or for women's uh, sexual and reproductive health might be? Uh, might be? So here, that's what I'm trying to do. And the other, well, the way I'm going to do this is really uh, through uh, talking, taking you through some of the concepts or the, uh, th taking you through some of the logic of why there should be a relationship between women's economic empowerment and sexual and reproductive health rights. And then using, uh, so thinking of the uh, logic, the reasons, the pathways through which a relationship can exist, and then thinking, looking for the evidence that exists or does not exist, and therefore thinking about new kinds of evidence that we can also look for. This is also important because, as I said, there might be negative things, but I want to identify gaps in the data. I also want to be able to better interpret statistical relationships. Most statistical relationships are uh, limited by the kinds of variables that they have in their data. So I want to tease out the meanings of some of these variables and see what, how, what, how we actually understand what's uh, going on. I'm also interested in this because it's a field in which one can't really do randomized control trials. For those of you who are, who are economists, you'll know that's the gold standard. 
that you every time you want to understand how A is related to B, you try to do a randomized control experiment and see which way, and, and then look at the control group and the intervention group and see what the results are. But real life is not a randomized control experiment. A lot of things are going to happen which are outside our control, and so we need to be able to have a story that links some of the things that happen rather than just depending on data analysis. Uh, 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 the other reason I'm interested is that uh, it, uh, thinking about the pathway between A and B, how does A lead to B, l allows us to come up with some uh, quick fixes. If we know, for example, that women's economic activity leads to better contraceptive use because working women have easy access, have better knowledge of contraception. Now, instead of waiting for everyone to start working and then become knowledgeable about contraception, once we know that that's the intermediate step, one can then find other ways of introducing knowledge into that population. At least in the short term, one can think of the mass media, one can think of NGOs, one can think of new technologies, one can think of door-to-door -door can canvassing and explaining <coughs> contraception to people. So understanding what is it, what it is that leads to women's, leads women's economic activity to better contraceptive use um, is a way of for, uh, for sort of shortcutting the process, pro uh, the process instead of waiting for women to become employed and only then waiting for contraceptive use knowledge to improve. And finally, I think this is important because it uh, guards us against a false sense of complacency. Because we think it's a win-win situation, we shouldn't think that, oh, women's economic activity has improved, that means everything's all right with sexual and reproductive health. Or the other way around, sexual and reproductive health is improved, that means women are empowered. And so we, I don't, uh, and that's, uh, that's a false complacency, something to be guarded against. And I'm going to give you just one small example of that, uh, of how, why one can go terribly wrong. I mean, we know that there are many places where women have always been active. Sub-Saharan Africa, women have been economically active forever, but their sexual and reproductive health is far from uh, uh, enviable. By the same token, we know that there are parts of the world where sexual, uh, where birth rates have come down, child mortality has come down, all kinds of good things have happened to the demography of the population, but women's status continues to be terrible, empowerment levels continue to be bad. So I'm going to give you just one example here. We know now, contrary to what we expected, that in many parts of South Asia, sexually transmitted infections have a very low level. We have very low levels. We thought they would be very high, but actually it turns out now this happened with the HIV epidemic where people had predicted a major epidemic in HIV AIDS in India. The CIA had said that's going to be the big threat of the future, the HIV epidemic in India. And then when we actually, finally the DHS did a round of uh, blood testing, discovered that the results, the levels of HIV infection were much lower than what had been predicted from those sentinel programs where they were doing very risk, where they were looking at high risk groups. And, it, and then further studies where you've actually tested for other kinds of sexually transmitted in, uh, infections, you find that they're very low in many parts of South Asia. Seeing that, one might be tempted to conclude how wonderful, that means there's great gender equality in South Asia. All these women have, are able to negotiate safe sex. All these women know how to prevent sexually transmitted infections. And in fact, it turns out to be the very opposite. It's that women in this country, these countries, are, their sexuality is so strongly controlled that they cannot get an STI because they're not free sexually. So it's the other way around, really. And so we might be uh, going up the false, uh, but so if we use women's sexually transmitted diseases as an indicator of gender equality, uh, we may be going in completely the wrong direction. Whereas if you're looking at sub-Saharan Africa, we might be making a, getting a totally different story. So one of the things I'm going to keep doing here is saying that it is important to have universal concepts, but it's also important to think about the local context, not to forget that. Okay, so that's why it matters. And it matters to me because I'm just very fascinated by the subject anyway. So. One more thing I should say, uh, this I'm talking really most of it here of one direction of causality or implied causality. I'm looking at the post potential impact of women's economic empowerment <laughs> on sexual and reproductive health. I'm not looking at reverse causality. I'm not asking which is actually as important and maybe at times more important. How does good se sexual and reproductive health in turn lead to women's empowerment? Uh, ICRW has a huge project going on, has been having a huge project of several studies looking at that direction of causality, and I I'm not going into that at all now. They have some very interesting results. I'm really looking at if we do decide to invest in women's economic empowerment, what might we expect to see in terms of their sexual and reproductive health and rights?
Okay, and the thing that I could uh, decide then is the first thing is we really need to know what we mean by the word empowerment. As I just said, it's not a question of 20 cereals in the grocery store aisle. It's really something more than that. What is it? And in recent years, for the ever since ICPD, for the last 25 years, that word empowerment has been part of both the social science as well as the policy, as well as the advocacy discourse. Different words have been used. Autonomy, agency, power, uh, decision-making ability, gender equality, uh, enablement. The ICPD time, I think the UN used the word enablement. So there were all these words, but sort of we seem to have now zeroed in more and more on the idea of empowerment. But what do we mean by empowerment? What do we mean by all these things? That there are as many meanings as there are people writing about these things. So to try and summarize that literature is extremely difficult. What I've tried to do is to come up with some kind of uni uh, central principle that can be set to define empowerment, and that in turn then one can think of what do, how does agency mean that, how does autonomy mean that, how does uh, gender equality mean that. And so what is it that I, the way, how do I describe empowerment? I describe empowerment as an expansion in the choices available to a person. So if I'm talking about the women's empowerment, I'm talking about women's, an expanded set of choices. I'm going to talk about what do I mean by choice, of course expanded set of choices uh, available to women is the way I would call them, um, uh, call empower, uh, the way I would characterize empowerment. That women become empowered when they can choose from a larger set of options than they could before they became empowered. That's the other thing, by the way, which may, oh, I'll forget. The empowerment, remember, is a verb, it's not a noun. So it's a process, it's going, moving from a situation of no, little or no power to a situation of greater power, and that's what empowerment is. So moving from a situation of few or no options, a uh, few or no, a little or no sense of agency or ability to exercise options to a situation where in fact you have agency and you have options to apply that agency to. That's the way I'm describing uh, empowerment. Now of course empowerment, and then one can see that empowerment can come in many ways if you define it as broadly as this, and that's what happens. So we, to assume that empowerment automatically means gender equality, women's rights being met, women's strength, I, I think is a misnomer. It, empowerment in the very narrow, in the very broad sense of just ex expansion of choices can occur in many ways which have not, which do not touch the patriarchy, which do not touch women's status. And therefore to assume that women are empowered and uh, meaning uh, ideologies have changed doesn't make sense. And while, so I'm going to talk about a few of the ways in which this expansion of choices can be mediated through ways that have nothing to do with women's liberation and the way we think about it when we use the word empowerment. For example, empowerment or the expansion of choices can occur both through what epidemiologists call environmental factors and host factors. What do I mean by environmental factors? You can have changes in the environment of women which give increases the ex uh, choices available to them. If you have good family planning clinics, if you have good family planning services, if you have good messages explaining how to use contraception or where abortion services are available or where how child prenatal care uh, is important, uh, when you do these things, you are empowering women for sure because women now have the knowledge to think about different kinds of options that they can exercise. So this is something being done from the outside to empower women without uh, necessarily needing an intrinsic change in women's own ideas about gender equality or ideology or sense of control over their lives or sense of their entitlement. That need not happen. Whereas ho when I talk about host factors, I'm talking about things that happen to women that increase their empowerment. So that's, that's, where, we, that's uh, where we assume that they're the same thing and they're not the same thing. So there are many things that the state can do, that NGOs can do, that other agencies can do to improve the environment of women so that their choices, they have a larger set of choices to turn to. But then if you want actually change on the ground in women's own attitudes and ideology and behavior, we really are aiming for what may be called changes in host factors, changes at the level of women. And that's what women's economic empowerment, for example, is. It's about uh, uh, giving women jobs so that they then get, uh, uh, they change uh, with that money and that knowledge and that authority, the bargaining power in the home, allows them to challenge the old way of doing things and therefore to get better, I have access to more choices. Then when one thinks about choices being expanded, 
that's it's not one thing. There are one makes choices in so many domains of life. It's not that I've checked because I can choose between X and Y. I can also choose between A and B. That needn't be the case at all. So one needs to think about different domains of choice. And I'm going to give you just two examples here uh, that are relevant to the women's economic empowerment debate. One is the domestic versus extra domestic environment. You can have a set of you can ha have power at home, but not have power outside the home. You can have power decision making and choice in outside the home. You may not have it at home. So, I did, or you might have it in both. You might have it in neither. So, when we are talking about women's economic empowerment, how does that empower women? One needs to think about which domains of choice does it empower women, and in turn, then how important are these domains for different aspects of sexual and reproductive health? Uh, for example, domestic power being increased is going to probably be good for intimate partner violence is going to be good for <coughs> sexual violence, is going to be good for child care practices. Whereas extra domestic power being increased might be important for other things. It might be important for contraceptive access. It might be important for ide moder modernity, ideas about what it means, new aspirations. So when you are exposed to the outside world, you have the, a new world of choices opens up. When your uh, authority increases at home, a different set of choices opens up. And the two need not go together. Different factors may be important. Educ Education might increase your power at home, but not uh, help you very much outside the home. Employment and the money that you earn might help you outside the home. It might not be a very good, uh, uh, very power-inducing power at home, especially given the nature of most em employment, which is so exhausting, so, uh, so much of a double shift of work. So that's one thing. The other way of thinking about domains of choice is there are some domains of choice which are uncontested. They're neutral. Everyone agrees that it's good for children not to die. Everyone agrees that maternal, by everyone I don't mean us, I mean families. They don't contest that women should survive uh, a childbirth, a difficult delivery. They don't contest that children need to be in good health. They don't contest that children should go to all have an education. So these are uncontested domains of choice. And those are easier for women to get. So when women are educated or employed, uh, the rest of the family allows them to take decisions on these uncontested matters. But there are contested domains of choice where empowerment might not be at all complete. If women want to use their new power to go for a movie by themselves, if they want to use their new power to have a boyfriend, if they want to use their new power to uh, use, have an abortion, those are much more contested categories. And those are categories where, in fact, women's empowerment uh, through the standard means of education or economic activity might not play such a strong role. So again, one needs to therefore not just use that broad term of empowerment, but really tease it out and think about what is it that we're trying to say when we say let's employ women because that's going to empower them. Empower them how? Is it going to give them better mothers, better wives, stronger, more self-confident individuals? What is it going to do to them? These are the kinds of things that we need to ask. What else? Then we need to think about pathways of empowerment. That why does women's economic empowerment or anything, education or anything, women's expansion of choices, how does it lead to outcomes uh, of in other fields? Does it happen in a purely instrumental way? After all, the educated woman can read. And so she can, for, to that extent, she can provide, uh, read the instructions on contraceptive use. So she's able to be a better, more effective contraceptive user. The employed woman goes out to work, which means that she is more easily able to enter a family planning clinic than a woman who doesn't go out to work. So these are the instrumental forms of women's empowerment. They don't have to change the underlying patriarchy. They don't have to change the underlying power structures or the gender structures, but nevertheless are important. They are empowering because they increase the choices available to women. Am I going too slowly? 15 minutes? Five more minutes. Five more minutes. Then I, I, the, Seven. Seven. <laughs> okay. So, but then there are other kinds of empowerment which are really. <laughs> there are other kinds of empowerment which may be seen, thought of as uh, uh, ideologically empowering. That women start questioning the status quo. 
this, uh, so very often instrumental empowerment leads to ideological empowerment, but it need not. Some kinds of empowerment are purely instrumental. You become a better wife and mother because you can identify a sick child. You become a better, uh, uh, able to take care of ill children. You become better able to understand a doctor's instructions. That need not change your attitudes at all, whereas ideological change really requires you to question the patriarchy, the existing gender e inequality that exists to a smaller or greater extent in all studies. And here it appears that a lot of these so-called empowering factors aren't as effective as we think they are. DHS data, for example, find that women who are working are, have very, are very good at achieving many kinds of good reproductive health outcomes. But when you look at their attitudes, their attitude to domestic violence, for example, you find that the majority of them still think it's justified for a man to beat, beat his wife. So they might not experience violence, the man might not beat them, but they do still buy into that ideology that it's okay for a man to beat his wife if she doesn't pr produce a hot meal, or if she refuses sex, or if she goes and uh, talks to strangers. So you can see that that underlying mindset hasn't been changed. So what is it that changes that mindset is a very different question from what is it that allows women to manipulate their environments in a strategic or instrumental way. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Then. We have to also keep in mind what, uh, by empowerment, we mean expansion of choice. But we mean expansion of choice according to our rules. If Turkey ha now has, has a democracy and has an election and votes an Islamic uh, government to power, is that an expansion of choice or we say they haven't expressed choice? So how do you distinguish between expressed choice and expansion of choice? Or it could be that it is, they do think that that's what they want. So we have to give them that right to, if you think that democracy means giving people the right to decide what they want, and that's what they decide, they decide that they want to wear a veil. Wear a veil. If we think that's a retrograde act, but if they think that that's how they're ex exhibiting agency, then this is an important question to keep in mind that outcomes may not turn out to in the direction that we want. And we have so many examples of an expansion of choice, but outcomes that we are not too happy with, including in this country. Educated, working women don't want to take the pill. They have unintended pregnancies because they're worried about how much weight they'll put on when they take the pill. They're worried about the skin problems that they'll get when they put, take the pill. Uh, in other parts of the world, uh, in India, if they're educated, you would think they'd become more gender equal, but they are the ones who, in fact, abort female fetuses. Uh, they are the ones, or employed women, you'd think, here, they're earning all this money, they're now going to become independent authorities, but in fact, they save that money for the dowry for their marriage. So, but they're expressing, they're expressing agency. So how do one does, does one, therefore, one cannot conclude from what their behavior, whether they actually have choices or not. Even bad behavior can be an outcome of expanded choices, and that's something to keep in mind. Finally, finally only for this section, and not for the whole presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, finally, one can think about uh, the opposite as well. When one gets good outcomes, one should not assume it's an expansion of choices. Just because an educated mother uh, looks after her children, or an employed mother first puts her employment into looking after her children. Can we assume that that's because she's empowered and has an expanded set of choices? It need not be. Social expectations in our society are so strong that educated women are supposed to behave in a particular way. An educated woman cannot say that, oh, my child is too ill, too bad, I still have to go for a movie. Or cannot say that I need, a, I, 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 I have earned an income, let me go and buy a new dress for myself. Her first thought is, no, I'm, if I'm earning an income as a good wife and mother, it's expected that I spend that money on my family's nutrition. So social expectations can, in fact, contract choices in the, for both with so-called empowering uh, attributes as well as with disempowering attributes. So just as we cannot, from choice, assume that uh, is, uh, from a behavior, we can't assume uh, the, whether choices have expanded, nor can we, uh, from our choices, assume that behaviors are going to go in a particular direction. Okay, now what, what is, so that's empowerment in general, but we are interested in the idea which I've already referred to every now and then of women's economic empowerment. And so we are talking about empowerment which comes through access and control of monetary or material resources. 
So what is economic empowerment? Economists tend to look at it in a very specific way, they like the UNF report, for example, and most economic reports use the word economic empowerment to talk about a rise in the productivity and wages of women. So rise in women's economic activities, rise in income earning activities, whereas non-economists tend to mo be more interested in generally in their control over money. So control over money, uh, economic resources, uh, and that can come from jobs, but that need not come from jobs. It can also come from other, in other ways. And also control not just about money, but control uh, of, over other domains of life, what I was just talking about, that e emp economic empowerment should also feed into empowerment in general. So then one can ask, uh, how, what are the multiple sources? So jobs really then are one form of economic empowerment. But there are other forms of economic empowerment that will give you control over money and material resources. For example, do you actually need a job or do you need a potential job to know that you have a job to fall back on if the need arises? And that is an important distinction given that taking a job means many other constraints in your life in terms of time, in terms of a double shift of work and things like that. So maybe the potential for work is as empowering as work itself. Maybe the nature of the work is as important as just having a job. Having a job which is based at home has very different implications for control over resources compared to having a job that takes you out of the home. Having a job which is regular has different imp uh, effects from a job that is more self-employed or, or flexible. So there are, I, I'm not going to go into details, but then property ownership can be a form of empowerment. And there are lots of groups now saying that we need to give women titles to property, whether it is their land, their home, or whatever else, that's as empowering as actually going out and earning an income. Access to credit, that's what all these microcredit uh, programs are built on, the idea that access to credit is empowering. Sometimes bride price and dowry, getting money for getting married, if you have some control, it can be empowering. Usually it turns out not to be. Other <coughs> factors are increase your empowerment. The older you are, the more control you're given over money. If you're a mother, you get more control than if you're just a bride. If you have children, you go, if you have a son, you get more control. And then, of course, there are otherwise equal gender relations. You don't have to have uh, your own income to have control over an income. And to me, this is best illustrated by this uh, cartoon. Where the woman says, your husband got the last one. This one's on mine, when they're, uh, who, whose credit card is. So neither of them has their own credit card or money. But they still have access to money, and they have control over money. So that's something to keep in mind. We don't have to always be giving jobs to women to get them to, uh, to, get them to feel economically empowered. Economic empowerment really needs to come. It shouldn't matter, finally, who earns the money. As a, as a true system of gender equality, uh, both everyone, the whole family should have access to one another's incomes because there are so many situations in life where, in fact, you're not going to have both people earning the money. Okay, there are several complications in trying to understand the relationship, and I've mentioned reverse causality, of course, and I said I'm not going into that. Then poverty, remember that we are not talking about you and me, we are talking about societies in which people are incredibly poor, incredibly constrained. And so poverty has an independent effect on empowerment and disempowerment. So when you give jobs to relatively <coughs> well-off women, the empowering effects can be very different from giving jobs to very poor women. And again, I don't have time to go into the details, but really you cannot talk about about women's em economic empowerment with a, without thinking in terms of what their poverty levels are. I, I could, if there's time later, we'll talk about that. Okay, how does all this play out into sexual and reproductive health and rights? Here again, we think we know what we're talking about, but really we don't. And sexual and reproductive health and rights is many things. There's the WHO definition, of a, a long definition of biological, of all kinds of well-being related to acts connected to pregnancy. I've got the full definition. I won't spend a minute reading it out. But basically, sexual and reproductive health and rights refer to a whole series of things to do with uh, having a, uh, the right to choose the number of children, to have the right to have a safe pregnancy and delivery, the right to not be coerced into fertility or the sexual relations, the right to uh, not suffer, to prevent and to treat sexual problems of the reproductive tracts, all kinds of rights and responsibilities are mentioned. So for example, if I had to some, uh, sort of put them in a list, I would put, well, these are the components really, no unwanted pregnancy or birth should occur and freely chosen number of births, safe pregnancy and delivery, prevention of reproductive tract infections, 
treatment of reproductive tract infections, freedom from sexual and gender violence, freedom from intimate partner violence, and what they call healthy sexuality, the right to good sexual relations. Here, that's something I'm not going to go into at all because that's really, it requires two hands to clap, and it's one man's meat really is another man's poison, so we don't know what that right means. But the other rights, I think we can sort of talk about what those other rights are, and then we can ask what kinds of expansion of choices, what kinds of empowerment are important for each of these. So I'm just not going to talk about each of them. I'm just going to take a couple of examples. For example, I'm going to talk about women's economic empowerment, uh, women's economic activity, women's economic empowerment, and fertility and contraceptive use. How would women's economic empowerment affect fertility and contraceptive use? It can affect it just in an instrumental way, which is what I talked about earlier, through a better understanding of birth control, better access to birth control, better knowledge to better birth control, better affordability to birth control because you have an income. And most studies find that what's most important is actually not just earning an income, but earning an income through work outside the house. For many parts of the world, the important deter economic determinant economic activity determinant of contraceptive use is a wage income outside the home. That itself tells you that it's not just the money. It's the fact of going out of the home, interacting with other people, being exposed to other people. So there are instrumental reasons that lead to better contraceptive use with jobs outside the home. This is particularly the case in parts of the world where women otherwise cannot move about freely outside the home. If you look at sub-Saharan Africa, where women have already always had a lot of mobility, in fact, you find the opposite result in DHS surveys. You find that women, it's not what where the job is that's important, it's the wages that are important. Earning an income is important because women anyway move around freely. So for that, and for trouble in sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the economic activity that I talked about earlier tended to be productive activity but unpaid activity. And that's why it was not having enough of an impact on contraceptive use. So there, it's the money that's important. In South Asia, it's not just earning an income, it's earning an income which takes you outside the home. So these are the ways of thinking about whether there's an expansion of choices involved, what domains does this expansion of choices occur in? And in fact, there might well be a certain amount of fertility decline associated with economic empowerment due to a contraction of choices rather than an expansion of choices. And the best example of that is not actually from poor countries, but from the industrialized world where there are many parts of Europe, <coughs> Japan, uh, Southern Europe in particular, where you find that the, although we have sub-replacement fertility, so TFRs are well below two, they're 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. Nevertheless, when you ask women how many children they want, they continue to say two. So it suggests there that there is a constraint. So just like women in poor countries don't have access to contraception, so there's an unmet need for contraception. It could be that in these very low fertility countries, there's an unmet need for children, which they cannot meet because of the other constraints on childbearing, state not providing enough support, Husbands not providing enough support. In fact, if you read that yesterday, there was a Pew uh, Foundation study on women's and men's roles that talked about how exhausted women are. And that uh, through, and you can see that that would be an important reason not to have children or to have fewer children, not that they don't want children. So whether you're actually catching an expansion of choices because you're doing this wonderful job and so that jo you don't need children, or you're talking about a contraction of choices because you have to work, and yet that work doesn't allow you to have the number of children you want, really is something very contextual, and you have to keep that in mind. Another example is uh, domestic violence. Whether women's economic empowerment, what does it do to domestic violence and sexual rights? Here, there's a lot of conflicting evidence. That, that seems, I think if I have to summarize it, it seems to be two th uh, things. One is that at the start, of women's in economic empowerment, a lot of studies, especially in Bangladesh on microcredit, have found that in fact violence levels within domestic violence tends to rise, perhaps related to men's greater feeling of emasculation or insecurity or whatever. But later on, more recent studies suggest that no, now sort of there's an equilibrium has been established and in fact domestic violence levels probably come down. So there's an initial period where things get worse and then they get better. It could also be a selection problem. A recent paper in demography by Amin and Bhatracharya, I think, talks about the fact that uh, uh, women who act go for these microcredit programs are women who are already very vulnerable to violence to begin with. 
So your sample may be biased. It's not that the signing up on the microcredit is making you pro, is making your husband hit you, but you, because your husband hits you, you go and try and become economically independent. So there may be something of that kind going on. And there's a difference also between attitudes and experience. Women's experience of violence may come down, but their attitudes to violence might not. And this, I gave you the example just now where I said about women's uh, attitude to domestic violence, even working women don't seem to think it's such a big problem that they think it's justified in many cases. Uh, but, and the last one is, uh, the interesting finding I found in the DHS is that attitudes to domestic violence don't change, but attitudes to sexual uh, coerced sex do change. Working women are much more likely to say that uh, the woman has the right to refuse sex if she is not in the mood of the husband, she, her husband should not be able to force her to have sex. Working women are much more likely to say that. Now, is that because working women are more empowered, or is it because actually working women know this as a reality in their lives? I just talked about how exhausting it is, and there was a new, recent New Yorker cartoon, which was very good. Worse than a headache, I have three kids and a full-time job. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what the a woman is saying. So, uh, so that's why she doesn't want sex. So it's not that she's empowered, it's probably the opposite. So that's why I talked about empowerment often being actually mistaking a contraction of choices for empowerment. And unsafe sex, I already gave you the example. And I'll <coughs> stop now and let's see, we'll have a discussion hopefully. Thanks. Well, thank, thank you very much, um, Alaka. So, um, what did I say in the beginning? An intellectual candy shop? <laughs> wow, that was, was amazing. Um, so, you know, to cover such a complicated subject um, in such um, a coherent way was, was really very compelling. And I just, as, as we move to Wendy's comments, I just wanna pull out a few things that I, I thought you said that were interesting and talk a little bit about how you framed um, your presentation, and I sort of see it in terms of three parts. So the first part for me um, was a series of general framing comments that you made that I thought were, were very important. And of course, I love that you had cartoons along <laughs> the way and great examples and your wonderful passion. But you talked about why this was important in terms of targets and thinking about how the, the targets as we move forward to 2050 agenda affect each other in a win-win situation, but also in non-win situations and what that ultimately means. I thought that was a really important point. And I really liked that you said life is, is not a randomized control experiment. We need to have a storyline that links all of these issues. I think that that's really important, an uh, important part of the framing. You talked about guarding against false complacency, a really very critical point for us as we think about how we frame and examine these issues. And you emphasize throughout the importance of having universal concepts, but thinking of the local context. So another very important framing comment, and I think you really gave a, a, a number of examples to, to demonstrate that. Really liked your, your talking about empowerment is a verb, not a noun. So that process, a really, really good point. So for me, those were a series of, of framing comments that I thought were quite significant before we begin to talk about those issues. And for me, that was the first part of, of what you talked about in your paper. The second part is when you really dove down into what you meant by economic empowerment. Um, and you, you covered a number of areas. You know, you talked about thinking of, of the environment and host factors and actors and where they can act. You talked about domains of choice and what that meant pathways for empowerment, expansion of choice versus express choice, a really good example from Turkey and what that meant and how we looking in from the outside could think about that. And empowerment um, as, as an expansion versus contraction of choices and then thinking of multiple sources of economic empowerment. So that was for me the second part of what you talk about, talked about, really just getting more 
into depth on this, this concept of economic empowerment in the different dimensions. And for me, the third part, what you talked about was bringing in um, the connection to sexual and, and reproductive health and rights. So making the connection to fertility and contraceptive choices, demand for, for birth control, making the connection to domestic violence, and then sexual rights and unsafe sex. So covered a lot of ground, yeah, but, <laughs> but just to help me think about what you covered, I sort of think about it in terms of, of those three areas, sort of the framing, the sort of delving deep into what we mean, or what are the parameters of economic empowerment, and then making the connection to sexual and reproductive health and rights. So that was wonderful, great passion, thank you. So Wendy, she's um, set you up for some, some great comments, I think. Um, so Wendy Baldwin is gonna be our main discussant on Alka's paper today. And, and as you see from Wendy's bio sketch, she's the president and CEO of Population Reference Bureau, one of my favorite organizations, not just because I've worked there, but, but my tagline for Population Reference Bureau, PRB, when I was there, I always talked about PRB as a policy relevant bridge, Ooh, PRB. I like that. So, so yes. You can use right. that. But, but this is very much what I, I appreciate about um, PRB's role in, in this area. As, as you see, Wendy uh, previously was the vice president and director of the Population Council's Poverty, Gender, and Youth Program, and prior to that was the executive vice president for research at the University of Kentucky, and then before that, deputy director for extramural research at um, the National Institutes of Health. So, um, Wendy, wonderful to have you here and very much looking forward to your comments. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to sit here. I don't have any PowerPoints, no cartoons, but I am going to tell you a story. Um, first, I want to thank Alika for such an engaging paper, and I'm a demographer, so I'm usually drawn to and usually asked to comment on much more straightforward demographic analysis where the goal is to get all of your variables in the model and have one last equation and explain a lot of the variance. And I find these my sort of natural habitat, but they're so unsatisfying in that they frequently have moved us away from the complexity of the lives we're trying to understand. And in general, I think there's a push to move to very parsimonious interventions. You have to have a singular thing. Nobody wants to hear, oh, that's complex. That's the way to turn your audience off, especially if it's a policy discussion, is to say, well, this is really complex. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> so let me tell you a story about why I just, one of, this is one of the things that came to me as I read, read Alica's paper, and I just thought the, the opening up doors to help us think about issues in a little different way and with a little more nuance. Four or five years ago when I was at the Population Council, I had gone to visit a program in Upper Egypt called Ishraq. And so this is two or three hours outside of Cairo. It's in a rural, very conservative area. And the council had a program to bring young girls, sort of 12, 13, 14 year olds, into this community-based program for literacy and health education and sports. And they took a great deal of time to build a relationship in the community because this was a community where girls did not typically go on to school after primary school. Girls were then at great risk of child marriage. And let's just say sports certainly was not in their, their lexicon, although each village had a community uh, center, youth center, open to all. But when you went there, there were 20-year-old guys playing soccer and watching soccer, and you, no one would have sent their 13-year-old daughter there for anything. So they negotiated with the community so that they would have girls only time, put in these really, I, I thought, just amazing programs. So we go to visit. They not only had the girls there, which was great, but they also had the parent council, the community council, the mayor, some guy with a gun, was never quite sure <laughs> what he was there for, but we all behaved very well and it was fine. And so we we're really trying to talk about the program because the whole idea was, was this a program that could be expanded? So after this little program, I'm talking to uh, one of the fathers. And um, he was on the parent council and seemed very enthusiastic. And I said, well, so you like the program? And he said, yes, yes. I, I think this program should be in more villages. It's very good. I said, good, oh, that's great. Um, that's what we wanted to hear. 
I said, well, why, what do you like about this for your daughter? She's been coming here for a couple of years. What do you like? He said, she'll get a better husband. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, wow. Okay, that's not in anybody's outcome measures. If there's <laughs> anybody here who is <laughs> sneaking in under the furlough from USAID, I'm sure that in all of the outcome measures for all of the interventions to improve adolescent girls' lives through all forms of empowerment and improving their health, getting a better husband isn't on that checklist. What woman has ever been served by getting a worse husband? No, no, so this seemed like a very good outcome. Now, we're, we don't know she was getting health education, so in fact that would mean she could take care of her children, but she was getting literacy training and the kind of the girls put on a skit where the, the mother in the skit uh, was duped into signing a piece of paper which she couldn't read, and she gave away some rights in the family, and she thought she was signing up for family planning, so it was a very clever skit. But it really, it was very clear that these girls were not just learning to read and write, they were learning to negotiate, they were learning their place in the universe as what it could be, what, how they could act, and to see that here was a father who saw that this was increasing her value. In so many settings, there's no investment made in girls, so there's not value. So you don't have value to protect. Now, okay, this could have all been very self-serving, and he could have thought that if, he made a, if she made a better marriage, she wasn't likely to run off and come back. But I'd like to think a little better of him. He really seemed to have understood that what was happening here was making her appealing to a different kind of husband. And what Alec has been trying to get us to do in this paper is think about the complexity of these relationships before we rush in, think we understand it, therefore we know how we could intervene and what we need to change when it may not be that at all. So I thought that was, was one of those sort of wake up calls to why we need to think about some of that complexity. Now, um, Alika had titled her paper um, let me get back here. What do we know and what can we know? And so maybe the way to think about my comments is, and how are we going to know it? So, you know, I, you know I, I'm always going to be pulled back to the methodology. You know, I'm like, like a moth to the flame here. But you've had enough theory already. So maybe now we can talk about some practical issues of if, if, if Alika has been able to encourage you that we need, that there is complexity, if we don't understand it, we're going to run into trouble, then you have to go the next step to say, can we actually deal with that? Because otherwise it looks like every script is different, which is certainly not the case. So um, I would just like to, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the methodological, what I would call methodological implications or ways to integrate sort of the methodologies we know with, with the complexity and the theory that, that, we've, that we've been hearing about. So first of all, I guess it's the clarity of concepts. And this is, should be a challenge to everyone. Everybody should have a post-it on their monitor there that says, think about the concept. Can you unpack it? Do you, what's the evidence you have that the, that the concept is, um, that you know what you're talking about when you have a, a label on something? So. Um, and I would suggest uh, try not to be seduced by concepts that have what I call high valence and low specificity, meaning everybody loves them, but nobody's quite sure what they mean. My personal favorite is agency. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds so cool. I want it. <laughs> I want my kids to have it. I have no clue what it means. And so, of course, we all can remember that um, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart Everyone know what he said? I can't define hardcore pornography, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> so you must be ever vigilant to stay away from concepts in our field that have that high valence. Everybody knows them and loves them, but if you were poked and prodded, you would have a hard time saying just sort of what is that? Now, that doesn't mean you get rid of them, but you step back and you start to unbundle them. It's when you unbundle them that you can actually test them and see if they have any what usefulness they have. I'm sure they all have usefulness, but as you've heard, it could go the opposite way the way we think it would. So forcing us to debate these concepts can help forge more of a consensus. It can identify intellectual gaps. Um, there's some pieces of Alika's paper that you didn't hear, the thought about what is it you have the right to choose not to do. 
It's not just that increased choice means you can choose to do something or have something, but you're able to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Or you're going to choose something that goes against the norm. The, this, this, having this intellectual exchange, clearly perfect for the Wilson Center, but is so essential to having um, these having concepts that you can actually test. Now, why do we care? Is this an intellectual exercise? No. We actually do generally want to intervene in some way. There are values laced all throughout this, and if you have a value position, it would be extra helpful to actually understand how those concepts knit together so that you would have half a chance that pushing on this part of the concept is actually going to give you the effect at the other end that you want. So and these concepts change and evolve over time. And employment sounds like such a simple one, but you've already had an introduction to why it's not simple. Um, and that's not because, sometimes that's not even because our thinking has changed, just the world has changed. At one point, employment meant being able to go out and work in agriculture and be out of the house. Well, that's not true in a lot of places anymore, but is it working in the house or out of the house that's important? If it's out of the house, one of the, one of the aspects of employment that I think really needs to be considered for women is whether it's in the informal sector or the formal sector. So just because you have a job, you go off to it, doesn't mean that it imbues you with a sense of control or a regular income. What is it about having that job and that income that makes a difference when you come home? Well, if it's, I'm, I can be guaranteed to contribute half of the rent, you better be in the formal sector because a lot of informal sector work is very uneven, it's very low status, it's viewed as not actually driving the national economy. So what is the mental map that people have when they're saying it's good to be employed or employment is empowering? So un when you understand more of these underlying forces, maybe that can give you ideas of interventions that do what Alka suggested, that there are some quick wins or ways to short circuit some complex problems. So if you observe that women who have money to spend have more power, that's a good thing, does it matter how they get it? So if I earn it, does that make it more valuable in this process than if I got it through a cash transfer program? So I didn't actually earn it. I did what I was going to do anyway, which is send the kids to school, but I got money for it, or from some form of welfare. Does it matter what that source is? Does the source have carry an implication about money that actually is part of what's giving it an impact? Uh, and the informal sector, which is a huge amount of the employment, you talked about employment being in the home, but certainly in sub-Saharan Africa, a huge amount of women's employment is in the informal sector. And when you actually sort of look at what those day-to-day -day activities are and the costs and the income, there's not much money changing hands. Now, maybe it's still valuable because it gets her out of the house, allows the woman to interact with others, gives her a public role, but what I'm saying here is, until you have unbundled that, I don't think you're going to be in a very good position to establish some kind of intervention because you don't know what you have to intervene on. So that's one of the, one of the, the problems I find in, in always kind of going to, the, um, going to the, what can we do with this information. So I'm glad RCTs, or randomized control trials, came up because I'm usually in the RCT bashing mode. Um, there's been sort of, unfettered enthusiasm for RCTs in our field. And bear in mind, I spent, Roger Mark didn't say how long, but I was at the NIH for <laughs> a very long time in a, in, a, in a hotbed of environment of enthusiasm for RCTs. It is the gold standard. Now let me tell you what's fundamentally wrong with biomedical, I'll tell you what's wrong with biomedical R RCTs first, and then what the messages are for us. So. Here's a randomized control trial, and randomization is fabulous because it does eliminate that selectivity into who gets the trial or not. So I was on a committee that reviewed randomized control trials. So asterisk in the first line to the footnote. The footnote is excluded from this trial are women, anyone over the age of 60, anyone with a, taking another medication, anyone who's already failed a drug trial for this, anyone who lives in a rural area, anyone who cannot come to 12 visits in the next 15 months. And I'm like, okay, well, everything I care about is in the footnote. 
So it's true, the randomized trial will be an elegant test of this drug or this drug versus that drug, but there's a real world. Now, when you pick up that model and you put it into a social science environment, you have just magnified the problems with the methodology. It's, it's fundamentally a good methodology, but it has to be applied to an appropriate question. Uh, and this is where I think unfettered enthusiasm for this as an approach gets us into trouble. We need to be very careful. Because it does. I actually sat on a panel where I had been said negative things about RCTs, and the guy came on next to me, after me, said, and we're doing RCTs in this. And I thought, I, afterwards, I apologized. And I said, I didn't mean to make you feel uncomfortable. He said, oh, no. He said, our agency had gone through a spell of saying the only kind of study we could have was an RCT. So the fact we just have some actually was a good day. That was not in the health arena. Um, so why is this a problem in our field? And if we want to answer the kinds of questions that Alec is posing. Well, because if you are if you have a complex social process, you have a huge problem in randomizing areas for that complex process. So you say, well, that's okay. You, you know, you're still just gonna intervene in some way. So that'll be okay. You can randomize on what that intervention is gonna be. Uh, but wait a minute. You're going to do this in a setting where you have to have sufficient sample size to have power. So, oops, now, you know, I can't just do individuals, I have to do villages, and you can't just do three and three, your statistical power is bupkis. So now I have to go to a setting where I can randomize 200 villages and 200 villages. Okay, now let's, if we all think about the world and the countries we're most familiar with, you can't do that everywhere. So all of a sudden, you have a very elegant approach to testing your question, but you can only test it in certain areas of India where there are sufficient villages to randomize them. And you can't certainly do it in Zimbabwe because the structure is so different, or you can't do it around nomadic populations. And all of a sudden, everything I'm interested in is now back in the footnote. So, hmm. this is a serious, serious problem. But there actually is a way that I think I've tried to talk myself through this one in reading your paper, that there's a way thinking through these models actually could help you. So if you got down to having thought through the complexity, so you said the thing we need to vary is not just does a woman have money, but how she gets it. So now you're not trying to, to randomize over a whole complex issue, but you have a very narrow point of intervention. Now you have possibly moved yourself back into the zone where some of these more structured tests could work. But again, if you don't have that complex model in your head, you just think input here, change there, all's good with no idea about what's going on in the middle. So again, I'm the, how could we get there? Um, the, uh, this will require a great deal of patience in sort of testing. So if, if you said, well, okay, this is good. I, I'm not gonna just test everything about empowerment, but I'm gonna test one little piece. It means to build up a knowledge base, then you're gonna have to test a lot of little pieces in different places and try to put it back together. Theory is our friend here. I love survey research. I love the methodology of demography. I just adore it. It is what I do, but it's not perfect. And the better your theory, the better you can interpret findings that aren't done in a perfect situation. And since practically nothing we do is perfect, having a little theory behind you is kind of really, really a good thing. And Alika talked about having the storyline. I would say it's the narrative, because that's incredibly trendier than having a storyline. <laughs> but you do have to have a narrative, and you do have to continually test that. So, let me pull one of her examples, which was the benefit of interventions that were mass media interventions. And mass media interventions are so popular because they are quick, cheap, they have a lot of return on investment. How trendy, right? Now, the problem is, what is it, you, you say, okay, well, women who are exposed to mass media have better knowledge and use of contraception, for example. That's our, that's our we'll observe that, and now we're going to go in and tinker with the mass media in order to get that effect. Well, if what the mass media is giving people is knowledge, factual information, there is a clinic and here are the hours, a condom will keep you from getting an infection. Great, that's perfect, very easy to do. But if that's not what the media is giving people, 
Maybe it is because the media is actually uh, soap operas or novellas, which are building in themes around reproductive health. Because what they're doing, yeah, yeah, there's information in there, but that's not what they're actually doing. What they're doing is giving women a narrative. How to talk to a provider, how to talk to a partner. They're helping them script that. So it's still the mass media. It's not the clinician providing me with something, but what is it that the media is doing? So a little more sophistication on that would be super duper yeah. good. Um, there was actually some very good discussion, which most people run from, uh, of values. And we tend to think that we've either, we're sure everybody's on our same page with values, or we're sure that what we're doing is value-free. I think most of us have gotten over the idea that anything is value-free. But um, it, it's, if, if you have a situation, for example, where women are sequestered, the need to look at that in terms of, is that a problem? I think was one of the nice pieces that was brought out in this paper. Maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not a problem, but that's maybe not our issue to solve. Maybe our issue to solve is, say, access to contraception or access to knowledge. And of course, the most current uh, articulation of that is the trial in Zambia, where it observed that giving women the option of getting coupons for family planning without the husband's knowledge seemed to work better than when he knew about it. So it's like, uh-oh, wait a minute. We want her to get access and we want her to use the methods, but is it right to generate something that seems to be subverting uh, intrafamilial decision making? Nice way of putting it. Well, I don't have an answer to this. I'd like to hear what the, the points are here, but women have hidden family planning from husbands for a long time. There are a lot of different ways to hide this. Men can hide a vasectomy from their partner. So possibly we have discovered something that is useful in terms of how we deliver service. Maybe we don't want to get too caught up in a values discussion, but again, I would like to hear what, what people said about that. Uh, I do take a little exception to the uncontested domains of, for exercising choice because I, I just think that one needs to be pulled out a little bit. And I'm thinking where women it, to say that it's an uncontested choice, that a baby will be healthy, that a woman will survive labor, I, I'm not 100% convinced. And if a woman cannot make the decision to see a healthcare provider if that provider is a male, or if a woman cannot make the decision to leave the home and go to the hospital if her husband is not there to sanction it, I think that's moved into a contested area of choice. So that was the, yeah. I'm struggling to find stuff I didn't like, you know, like what kind <laughs> of um, so, that's where I'm, um, I'm, I'm a little concerned. The other, the other one is on, uh, comes to remittances. So certainly if you look at the literature out of Latin America, you would say, whoa, look, men migrate for work, they send money back, women now have control of money that they didn't have before. Yeah. They spend it differently, it benefits the children, it benefits nutrition, ooh, good. Okay, well this is kind of a narrative that is out there about remittances, and remittances are a huge phenomenon around the globe, underappreciated in my book. But I was in Bangladesh, and there's a very strong labor migration to the oil producing states. And what the women were saying there was, yeah, that used to be the case. Now, cell phone costs have dropped so low the husbands go to the oil producing states and work, they call home three times a day, and they are making every decision. So it's like, whoops, mm -hmm. empowerment just went down a notch there. So, interesting. I guess see this. Mm. Gotta think it through. Okay, so now one last practical point here is I have to put in a pitch for an approach that I am particularly fond of and I think it's underutilized, and it's a mixed methods. So, because I love survey data, and if we didn't have the DHS to crunch, I mean, we would be so in the dark, and countries would be so in the dark about things that are happening that I would never back away from the benefit of survey research, and certainly not anything of the quality of DHS, which is astounding. On the other hand, I don't think we do enough when we look at it and say, yeah, that variable pretty much explains it well. Like 80% variance, that's really good. 70, that's really good. No, it's not. It means you have a lot of cases that you should have been able to predict and you can't. I wonder why. We should all wonder why. And I would like to see more studies set up so that you agree at the outset that after the survey, I can keep looking at you, right, because you know I'm, we're neighbors, that 
that you know that you might come back to talk to someone more. Because what happens when you get that off-diagonal case? So you get a situation where you've predicted that employment will lead to some beneficial effect in, in sexual and reproductive health. But then you've got women who don't work who are doing at least as well. Like, okay, you've controlled for everything else and you're still back to, yeah, it just doesn't look right. We should, if we could structure our research so that we could go back, and we're not saying, you didn't tell us the straight story, you're going back to say, I didn't ask you the right questions. Could I ask you more? And you might discover the situation that Alika pointed out that maybe I don't have to be working to have the benefits if I know that I could be working. So if things go bad in this relationship, I know I could get out because there are jobs, women like me work, not a problem. So it isn't the actual working in terms of that interpersonal dynamic, it's the potential to do it. Well, we would be so much better off if we could take our survey research and then go back and do qualitative research in what I like to call the off-diagonals. You would have predicted one thing and they, they, don't, they don't fall on that prediction line. And it would help us so much to understand more about the complexity that underlies these processes that we're all struggling to, to understand. But they are my comments. And I just thank want to, again, you. thank Alika for such a, a welcome breath of willingness to embrace complexity and values and even reverse causality. Man, that never happens. <laughs> um, and just opening it up to you all. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Wendy. So some, some excellent uh, <laughs> comments about yeah, so willing to, to look at the complexity of relationships, clarity of concepts, making sure that you can test your concepts, recognizing that concepts change and the world is changing. Um, so good points about randomizing processes in a social context and, and what that means, um, having a better theory, looking at values, uncontested domains and how that changes, um, recognizing some issues around remittances and changing roles there, and then a case for myth mixed methods and going back to say I didn't ask the right questions. So let's open it up for some comments, thoughts, and I would ask, um, because we're recording this, to please, um, as my colleagues come around with the microphone, to give your name and affiliation. And normally we were going to have uh, Sandra Jordan from USAID also join us, but because of the current uh, situation, <laughs> she's unable to join us, but she's here in spirit. So let's, let's take a few questions. Hello, I'm Allison Brisk. I'm a visiting fellow here at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. And um, I'm normally a professor at UC Santa Barbara. Um, so I really appreciated the presentations. Um, I come up as a human rights scholar and um, I'm going to take the liberty of channeling my inner political scientist, if I may, <laughs> to throw another big thing on the table. Um, so I started out looking at sort of government and opposition, you know, human rights issues, forced disappearances in Latin America, and that sort of thing. And as I've turned to working on women's rights issues and my current project on violence against women, global campaigns about violence against women, uh, increasingly, we are looking at empowerment. I've learned much more about socialization, social power, and so forth. And yet, at a certain point, I find that we need to turn back to rights because we sort of, you know, in terms of um, blurring of concepts, we say empowerment and rights. <laughs> and that's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, and even though we <coughs> all have learned to expand our vision of rights and that there are private wrongs and social bases of empowerment and socialization and so forth, at a certain point, the law, the state, security, that's another thing that gets kind of blurred into the equation, plays an incredibly important role. I know that you have all drawn on Valerie Hudson and company's work <laughs> where, you know, there's a strong connection between family law and violence against women. Um, this, you know, complex relationship between economic empowerment and domestic violence um, that may go up and down over time. Well, that may also vary by women's legal status, access to protection and security, these programs for women's police forces, et cetera. So I would just like to, as 
uh, one of our famous political science books, that bring the state back in um, and see how you think that figures into this whole equation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let's take a few more questions or comments. Yes, please. Mihira Kara, Office of Population and Reproductive Health, USAID. Uh, thank you very much. This was wonderful. Uh, I normally don't have the opportunity to listen to a lot of such strong discussions, and I have my gender folks trying to teach me a lot of things, which is great. This is wonderful. Uh, I may not be able to articulate my comment very well, but I'll try my best. Uh, uh, a couple of things. One, Wendy, just because you spoke last and it's in my mind, talking about Nava's research in Zambia on the uh, giving uh, contraception uh, without the husband's knowing, she was here a few months ago and I had a long discussion with her and she did say that when she went back later, she felt those women were actually very uncomfortable. That it may have worked well, but they were not comfortable mm -hmm. about that. So basically, in fact, she's working a lot more about on demand creation and trying to involve the men also in future work, just as an aside. On the other, but related to that, I was wondering, uh, there is this assumption that, or maybe it's not there anymore, that if women are unempowered, that the men are, and that's not necessarily true. I mean, the ch limitation of choice, the way you define empowerment is wonderful. It was about expansion of choices. And I think the men are as bound by their perception of what choice they have in how they behave based on the cultural norms and things like that, that it would be interesting to see whether this other phenomenon you saw about violence going up and down was maybe because the men also realized <coughs> how it was empowering them yeah. to have the women empowered. At one point a while ago, a colleague told me, oh, to give power to women, you have to take it away from the men. And I don't necessarily agree, not because I have any evidence, but I think this idea of the individuals themselves gaining more power by taking it from society overall might be something to think about and maybe cover a little bit in your paper regarding the relational one. Great. Yes, please. Hi, Kirsten Stobanel from ICRW. Um, and I, I just want to uh, first thank uh, all the speakers and Alika for giving uh, ICRW a plug. Maybe no one else noticed it, but I, I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because we're, we are doing work that's looking at the, the other direction of the relationship, uh, meaning we're, we're looking at a series of case studies that looks at um, if whether and how fertility decline has impacted on women's lives. And um, to, to throw ourselves right into the fire of the issue of reverse causality, of course, is one that comes up always. I mean, it must, because we're, we are by definition reversing the, the, you know, what was considered a known relationship. Um, in the 80s and 90s between women's empowerment and, um, uh, and then uh, outcomes on fertility. So I guess what I, um, because we're sort of, you know, uh, sifting through all this, um, I'm, I'm curious, Alika, when you were looking at this relationship between women's economic empowerment and sexual and reproductive health, um, when you were looking at the evidence, how strong is the evidence that, that, that you know, as far as you can assess it, um, in you know in that direction i mean a lot of what you know going back and looking at the studies in the 80s and 90s that protest the other you know <laughs> um, that women's empowerment is leading to um, um, fertility decisions you know often the research is really just association but the 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 this, you know, the, the hypothesis behind it is, is that the causality is in one direction. So I guess I just wanted to get a sense from you as to the strength of the evidence. And then I also wanted to just, um, I really enjoyed listening to your, the way that you've defined um, empowerment for the, these purposes. And I'm gonna throw myself into the fire again because um, Wendy's favorite term, agency. Um, I'm just, uh, one thing that I was thinking about when you were saying it's an expansion of choices um, from the host environment perspective, that, that first sort of set of examples. I mean, if a woman is provided with a lot of information, but then cannot act on it, which is what I would think of as agency. Um, I, don't, I'm, I, want, I want to hear you talk a little bit more about how, you know, how that's empowering or how that could be empowering. Okay, thanks. 
Thank you. Any more comments? So I'd like to throw one additional point out there. So in, in uh, another um, catchphrase that we have, which is another one of um, these agency type catchphrases that we very often hear being discussed now is resilience. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion around resilience, resiliency, and what that yes. means. And the literature that is looking at the various dimensions of resiliency, um, whether it's societal resilience, a community, individual resilience, one of the key components that's very often talked about is social capital in terms of networks and mentors and mentoring. Yeah. And I wondered, Alka, if you could talk a little bit about how you see this fitting into your definition and operationalization of economic empowerment. So we have a number of things, rights, bringing the state back in, men, re causality, agency, and resilience and, and social networks. So. Could, would could you I like maybe to start? Off no, here is the, the issue on men. I'm usually the one on the panel that says we've got to include the men. We don't, we, I agree absolutely, we don't know the extent to which men's options are constrained. We look at the differential and see they typically have more options or more choices than women. But more, again, that can be that much more and it's not meaningful. Can you use the microphone? Whether they whether our interventions with women, whether we can make them see that it also Im improves their empowerment. I mean, if there is a way right. to do something to change the perception of empowerment of, for both. I mean, well, I had an example in my comments, and I skipped it, which was one of the things we know is when men are unemployed, if their wives are unemployed, if their wives are employed, rather, the men take longer to find a job. And I'm going to bet that means they've taken longer to find a better job because they had that option. And so we we very often drift into looking at this really just from the women's perspective, which is nuts because we're actually talking about a very close intimate relationships where both the intimate lives and the economic lives are, are highly intertwined. Uh, and I mean, we've got situations of child marriage where the, the men were promised as children to be grooms for a particular bride. They have the no choice. And that's not the same situation as the 13-year-old who gets married off to a 50-year-old she doesn't know. But there are other issues of child marriage even that it's important to actually look at that breadth. But score, I'm so happy to see someone else raise the, the issue of understanding how it affects men. And they affect it. Uh, thank you. A lovely set of questions, some of which I did sort of bring up in the paper, though not in the presentation, <coughs> but uh, I, I need to, I'm going to now really rewrite the paper. The first one, uh, Alison, right? Yeah, about the role of the state. Absolutely. In fact, I do refer in three or four places in my paper to how many of these things become an excuse for the role state to abdicate its role. And so I am talking about that. The, the state, I don't mm -hmm. think putting all the responsibility for their own welfare on women is right at all. I think the state has a huge role to play in providing uh, the minimum services, the backup services, and uh, in fact, substituting for women's disempowerment rather than be making them responsible for that. So, and so the human rights angle, absolutely, that there are many things that are rights in themselves and they should not have to be fought for by women through their education or their jobs or whatever, which means that women who don't have the education or the jobs, therefore, are not entitled to them. So I do, but I'm going to strengthen that because I actually do feel very strongly that with this uh, current trend towards either privatization or towards so-called public partner, private partnerships is actually giving the state an easy way out. So I, I think that uh, that's certainly very important. Uh, then uh, Mihir? Yeah. Mihira. Mihira, yes. I should have realized the male female difference. So, yeah. But, but, uh, Mihira, yeah. Uh, the, this actually, about 10 years ago, I wrote a piece of uh, an Arctic paper in Health Transition Review, which no one wanted because it was just after ICPD. It was called What About Men's Rights and Women's Responsibilities? So, uh, and I think so. I think because it's not, first of all, the it's not a case of. Uh, 
uh, you versus me. I don't think that's the way it's to be seen at all. It's the larger structures in which everyone is caught and everyone is uh, constrained. And I think men are as constrained. As that. I talked in particular about bringing in class. So and I talk, in that paper, I talked about poor men compared to rich women. And uh, there's, I mean, you cannot make it a gender issue at all. And in my right reading, I tend to use the word gender as a metaphor for any unequal uh, relations. I don't mean male-female. So I absolutely take that. And I'm saying this also because, I again, I have this in the paper. DHS data are very interesting in this. You see, where in the uh, typically we, the questions are framed in terms of, say, how, how free are you to do uh, go to the uh, look after a sick child. And the question will be, not at all, uh, a little, a lot, completely. And we treat that, uh, this as a graded hierarchy, and it's not. And you discover, in fact, that the determinants of completely responsible are all disempowering determinants compared to shared, equal. That, uh, uh, so that the shared responsibility, in fact, is the one that shows the best empowerment. And in fact, so you find that, that in creating an index of one, two, three, four is totally not the way to go as soon as you realize that four stands for complete and three stands for sum. So, uh, yeah, and, but this is something I think, and that's why you have all these embattled men's uh, uh, associations in many parts of the world. And I think <coughs> it's important because there is, to me, in fact, increasingly thanks to the advocacy and the role, uh, publicity that women's issues have got, uh, uh, class is going out of the picture in a way that I think it should not. So that's one thing. And then. Kirsten, of course, how can I not mention ICRW because they are doing this wonderful work on uh, the reverse causality and they have so many studies, so many results. In fact, it's just too much to get. So they are now trying to, I think, make individual studies and, try to, and I don't envy them trying to do a synthesis paper of all the different things that they found in their individual studies. But so the thing what you said about the reverse causality in our case, uh, the literature in the 80s and 70s and 80s was all about women's uh, empowerment leading to better sexual and reproductive health, in meaning code language for lower fertility. But uh, actually, if you go further back, it was the other way around, where it was the Western world we were talking about. It was, in fact, at that time, it was believed that women's reproduction is their break on empowerment. So it's sort of we've been going cyclically. That time it was all anthropologists and they, their work thing was about that until women can break out of the shackles of childbearing, they're not going to be free. And that's why 1960 and the discovery of the pill was such a turning point where you had this huge jump in women's education in colleges, huge jump in women's labor force participation after the, the introduction of the contraceptive pill. And you have this. Uh, uh, natural randomized experiments, Claudia Golden and all, where you have different states in the US uh, legalizing the pill for unmarried women at different times, and you can relate that so nicely to differences in women's labor force participation, women's education, etc. Unfortunately, uh, you have an uphill task because we don't have those kinds of natural experiments for most other studies. So I came across some, but most of it, that's why I keep saying that one needs a storyline at the back, that variable A and B, once one is talking about how they're connected, one has to have some narrative, not storyline, about <laughs> the, what's going on. And so I did come across some things, and I think we're meeting next week, and we'll talk more. So, and uh, yes, uh, uh, Roger Mark and resilience, absolutely. In fact, that brings me full circle back here. That social capital is again one of those wonderful things which are being given too much responsibility. It's again becoming a way for the state not to take the responsibility because people will turn to their larger kith and kin groups. And uh, so social capital was, is a wonderful idea. I think it's a great intellectual idea. It's a great support to people who have nothing else. But that's not a support that we want to therefore say that things are okay. Yeah, so I would come back to the state. I don't know how to bring the state back, so I'm glad there are people here who are thinking about that because it's going in a very un, uh, unsavory direction for me. So, Alkaz, as we wind up, what are the uh, what are the plans of the paper? When are we all going to get a copy? Because we want to have a look at, at the the final version. How, what got, are your plans? I've got several pages of notes here, so <laughs> I, and I'm hoping to do another uh, presentation or two. I think I'm going to do one at the University of Maryland, 
and uh, and one or two in India, in fact. So right. hopefully by, uh, by the end of the year for sure, but maybe November. That's my aim. When I'm still excited about it, as soon as I get diverted, <laughs> I won't do it. And now yes. it's all fresh. But yeah. I'll come back to some of you. So uh, I'll have the I'll have a list of participants, and now I have your names. So I'll come back for more advice and help. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you thank very you. much. This has been very uh, stimulating and engaging, and we're really looking forward to, to seeing the paper and, and yeah. some very good comments and reflections for us, Wendy. So thank you also very much. Let's So as, as we typically do at the Wilson Center, we'll write up a summary of the discussion and we'll have a link um, to a preliminary version of one of um, Alka's PowerPoints, Alka's PowerPoints. So please be on the lookout for that. And we'll encourage you to visit us um, at wilsoncenter.org and to have a look at our blog, newsecuritybeat.org. So we have the room uh, for a few more minutes if you'd like to stay just to chat a little bit here or out, uh, outside. Uh, please do so. Are they allowed to put comments because... on the website when you have a PowerPoint? <coughs> so if people have things to say, I'll be very grateful. We can, re we can receive comments on the blog. So we will encourage that. Yeah, that would yeah, be, be very helpful. Yeah. Great. Thank Great. you. Thanks for coming.